Okay, so I'm joined today by Ian McDermott. Ian, thank you for joining us. Ian's a, um, a knee surgeon, exclusively knees, only knees. Um, we're going to talk mainly today about um, chondral articular cartilage issues and knee replacements. Um, before we get into that, though, we're, we're, as, as may, may most people know, we're recording this on Zoom. So the first question, Ian, um, trousers or no trousers? <laughs> uh, um, seat trousers. Tracky box, tracky box for me. So, uh, you know, quality That's acceptable nowadays, isn't it? What's that? That is acceptable nowadays. Isn't oh, I it? think so. Yeah, I think even underpants are acceptable these days. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, <laughs> right. That's the formalities out of the way. So, um, so yes, Ian. I know um, you know. You, I've, I've seen you speak. And we've spoken before, and I've seen you know lots of posts on on social media and stuff. And I know, obviously. You're, you're what we might call a, a conservative uh, knee surgeon, meaning that you know you would only operate on a, a small percentage of the patients that come to you. And um, I know you're very keen on you know uh, patients really when it comes to knee replacements, that being the last resort. It, you know it's a it's a big deal. Um, it's a big operation, and it's a, a you know usually quite a sizable rehab. So um, my my first question really to you is in terms of you know trying to offset that you know knee replacement for as long as people can. What's your what's your take on and what's your opinion on um, things like um, what we might what we want to call biologic, so PRP injections, stem cells, um, and that sort of stuff? Okay, I wouldn't call myself a conservative knee surgeon. I okay. call myself a um, decent surgeon, but more importantly, a decent doctor, and more importantly, a decent person. Yep. Right. No, That's honest, no. Yeah. Yeah. So no, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm agreeing with you. Don't worry. But I'm just, I'm just putting a different slant on it. Yeah. I think any surgeons, you can't be a decent surgeon without being a decent doctor. You can't be a decent doctor without being a decent person. And any decent person would never operate on somebody unless they need it, unless it's appropriate. Sadly, 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 I absolutely cannot say that about all of my colleagues. And as you well know, there are non-conservative surgeons out there who are very, very trigger happy on the scalpel and all too happy to recommend surgery. I think the, the litmus test is very simple. What would I have done if it was my knee, right? Or, you know, if it was my son, my daughter, my wife, etc. what would I want them to have done? And do, un, do unto others as, as you would have done unto yourself. Yeah. There, are, there are occasions when I do actually recommend people, you know, I actually, sorry, encourage people to have surgery and that's when they really need it for example they've got like a locked knee well you can't mess around with that yeah. or if somebody's got a really unstable joint it keeps on giving way and they're developing you know lots of further damage in their knee then i'll just explain to them well yeah you don't have to have knee surgery but if you don't there's going to be knock-on consequences yeah so um yeah and in terms of numbers i i tend to operate on about roughly 25 percent of the people i see in clinic and that means that 75 percent of the people i see don't need surgery or maybe don't need surgery yet and maybe all they need is just well everybody needs and everybody deserves a diagnosis that's the first thing mm -hmm. but then a majority of the people i i see don't you know end up needing maybe physiotherapy or some other kind of treatment so the actual question <laughs> right, biologics um are we allowed to swear on this or not um if you like yeah because biologic sounds to me very much like, you know, kind of bio bollocks, really. Um, <laughs> so I'm sorry for saying that. To anybody who's sensitive, here's a caveat, all right? I'll give you a warning right now. If you're sensitive and if you don't, if you can't handle the truth, then get out of the kitchen, turn off, right? Um, most of these injections are just utter bollocks. And that's, and that's at best, right? Now, the problem is with these injections, you've got a lot of people out there who all they've got is just a needle and syringe. Right. They, they, they're not surgeons, they may be sports docs or, or whatever or whoever they are, but they, if, if you don't, if you've got a man and all he's got is a hammer, he sees the whole world as nails. And a lot of people accuse surgeons of seeing everything as a potential operation and as a surgical solution to everything. Well, that's not the case. But likewise, you can't fix things with, with it. there's a lot of things you can't fix with injections. Yeah. So when you talk about injections, you've got to ask about, well, what are you injecting? And there's a whole range of different different things. First thing is easy, steroid. Mm -hmm. right, steroid is the cheapest and the most tried and tested thing that you can inject in the knee. Yeah. Now, very importantly, um, steroid is just a very powerful anti-inflammatory. It's not anabolic steroid, it's a corticosteroid. It's a, it's a strong anti-inflammatory. It's like taking a massive dose of neurofen all in one spot. Yeah. So it's great at reducing pain if you've got inflammation. 
So if you've got somebody with like rheumatoid arthritis and inflammatory arthropathy or something like gout or pseudo gout, and you just want to quieten down the joint because they've got an acute attack, then storage is fantastic and very effective. If you've got somebody with osteoarthritis, um, then yeah, it acts as a painkiller, like a painkiller with the anti-inflammatory effect. But very, very importantly, if you've got any kind of mechanical damage or structural damage within a joint, if you give a steroid, all you're doing is masking the symptoms. Now, if you mask somebody's symptoms, then that encourages them to do more, which means that whilst they're doing more, they're causing further damage without realizing it. So by the time that the injection's worn off, they've got worse damage and they're worse off than they were beforehand. Very good paper published just a few months ago. Um, I'm losing track of which number lockdown it was. And what it showed is that for every injection of steroid you're giving to a knee joint, you increase the likelihood of that patient ending up needing an, uh, a knee replacement wow. by 10% per injection. Wow. Okay. So yeah, fine. You can inject steroid into the knee, but you've got to know why you're doing it, who you're doing it on, and you've got to understand the consequences. Yeah. So it's not, you know, it's not an easy fix. It's great for masking somebody's symptom, buying them some extra time, keeping them going for a bit longer. And I do, not very often, I do occasionally give steroid injections into somebody's knee if they're arthritic. If, for example, they've got a big round the world trip coming up or they've got a one of their kids is having a wedding and they just want to get through it and they want to buy them some extra time. Yeah. So is it effective from that perspective? Yeah. Is it long term effective? No. Is it long term harmful? Yeah. So very cautious. Then you move on to things like PRP. Hmm. Right? And I'm not really sure. I mean, PRP, platelet-rich plasma, maybe it stands for point, pointless rich physicians. <laughs> right? And what it means is, is these people are, are taking 15 mils of blood, spinning it down, just getting the serum bit, and just, sorry, the plasma bit with growth factors in it, injecting them into a joint and saying, oh yeah, it's going to make you knee better. It's not, it's a load of rubbish. Right, there's some evidence for the use of PRP for certain things like tendinopathies, but when it comes to an arthritic knee, it's pointless. Then you've got things like hyaluronic acid, which is a long chain viscous molecule, and, that, and that's like concentrated joint fluid almost. Some people say it has a chemical effect like a painkiller. Some people say it has a mechanical effect like it lubricates your knee. Yeah. Um, and may, maybe one is right, maybe one is wrong, maybe they're both right, but in all probability they're both wrong probably does nothing and the american academy of orthopedic surgeons which is the biggest organization in the world for orthopedics they did a big meta-analysis for the published data all the different studies that have been done and that was a few years ago now and their conclusion was that it's no better than placebo so you might as well just inject a little bit of saline into somebody's knee and if you do it in a really convincing fashion for about 40 percent of people will, will actually notice a benefit and that's purely placebo effect Whereas a bit of saline costs you nothing, right? whereas hyaluronic acid is a few hundred pounds per injection. Mm. So it's probably pointless. If there is any benefit, it's probably minimal. Does it make anything grow back? No. Do I recommend it? No. If somebody comes along and says, I, please will you inject hyaluronic acid into my knee? Because last time it worked brilliantly, then you've got a moral dilemma. Mm. Because if they absolutely yeah. believe in it, Mm. and you say okay i'll do it again then there's a not insignificant chance that they'll get a positive placebo effect from it mm. but morally should you do it if you know that scientifically it's a load of you know yeah yeah b word um then it's very difficult that's that's a real genuine moral dilemma and it's an awkward one yeah so i very 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 rarely if ever inject hyaluronic acid and then You've got the peak, the, the, the peak of the crop, the real absolute crooks out there. And you've got these charlatans. Unfortunately, they're kind of dotted around the, the Harley Street area predominantly who are doing stem cell injections into people's knees. They're absolutely not stem cells. Right? These are macerated, smashed up fat cells. What they're doing is they're doing liposuction. So peri umbilical li liposuction around the tummy, getting the fat putting it in a big, big syringe, about 100 mils or so, ball bearings in it, shaking it, like there's vigorously shaking it. And, um, and what that does is it smashes the fat to, to smithereens. And then what they're doing is getting the, the top, waiting for it to settle, getting the top layer and saying it's got regenerative cells in it and injecting it into your knee. 
scientific evidence is zero. It's got no clinical evidence to back it up whatsoever. And by the way, they're charging about £8,000 per injection. It's an absolute unmitigated total scam. It's disgusting that they're doing it. It makes me sick to think that there are, are people who are doctors. And it makes me angry to think that the GMC and the MHRA and the HTA, all the, all, all the statutory uh, bodies who have got a responsibility to protect the public from these kind of crooks have done nothing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Apart from that, it's mine. And, and what about the, um, the, other, the other option of stem cells when it comes to, uh, which is bone marrow derived stem cells. That's the other option that people would have, would have come across. So not, not taking the fat, but actually taking bone marrow and doing the similar sort yeah. of process. So that's called, that's called BMAC, bone marrow aspirate concentrate. And again, they're not really stem cells, it's a mixture of stem cells. I mean, the, the numbers of actual stem cells, genuine stem cells within the, those samples is absolutely tiny. I think it's, I think it's something like one in, one in 2,000 or one in 20,000, it's something tiny. All right? Some people say it has a slight anti-inflammatory effect. All right? It probably does absolutely nothing. And if it does have a slight anti-inflammatory effect, well, why spend hundreds, if not a few thousands of pounds injecting something that just has a slight anti-inflammatory effect? Well, why not just take some anti-inflammatories? Or yeah. if you have to, a steroid injection. Mm -hmm. So again, everybody's looking for this magic cure, right? It's, it's just not out there. The, the, the long-term reality is that in the future, it will all be about gene therapy, um, tissue engineering, you know, growing new organs in a lab and implanting them. Um, at, that, at the moment, that's just science fiction. There's research going on, it's all lab-based, like proper stem cell um, treatments are available, but you have to take a stem cell, you have to isolate it, and that's by looking at it, what cell markers it does or doesn't have in the lab. Then when you've isolated those specific stem cells, then you've got to culture them in a lab. And that's incredibly time consuming, incredibly difficult and very, very expensive. Mm -hmm. And all of the trials, are basically clinical trials, university linked. So anybody in a clinical setting who says I'm going to inject some stem cells in your knee is either, again, an idiot, um, a madman or a crook. And unfortunately, unfortunately, there's a lot of the latter out there. Yeah. OK, excellent. Um, so then in terms of when if that was an option, then what, what are people's options then, let's say, before they get to the, to the knee replacement, which which you might advocate? Again, potentially surgical, but you know, what sort of options would you say yeah. you've got to give? Oh, up? God. Massive, massive long list. All right. Knee replacement is last on the list. Yeah. Right. Knee replacement is a really big up, big up, painful, significant potential risks, slow, difficult, really difficult rehab, and no guarantees of a, success, a successful outcome. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you keep that in reserve. So, you start from the bottom and you work your way up. We yeah. refer to this as the therapeutic ladder. And there's a lot of runs on that ladder. So you start off with nothing and nothing doesn't mean absolutely nothing. It means patient education, just re reassuring somebody, letting them know what they've got and let them know that it's not life or limb threatening. It's not an emergency. Um, yes, it will probably get worse with time, but you know, there's various ways to work around it. Yeah. One step up, well, take some painkillers, take some anti-inflammatories. You don't want to be popping pills regularly for the rest of your life. Um, they have got potential side effects, but you know, much, much easier to take a few painkillers and anti-inflammatories than to have a knee replacement. Yeah. Next, activity modification. You know, this big, this big thing that you've seen all over Twitter um, about whether or not people should run if their knees hurt. Well, it's just a bit stupid, really. Mm. You know, somebody comes to me and says, Doc, Doc, my, my knees hurt when I run. What do you think the first thing I'm going to say to them is? Don't run. Mm, maybe. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and what's the best way to really upset and alienate yourself from, from a runner? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so it depends. If you've got serious damage in your knee, all right, then really you've got to keep fit. You've got to keep healthy. You know, you can't be healthy without being fit. Right. And you've got to keep the weight off and you've got to keep your muscle bulk up. But you don't have to pound your knee. So activity modification, swimming, cycling, cross trainer, rowing, whatever it takes, but don't pound your knee. Don't do what feels like it's not good. Simple biofeedback, you know, no pain, no gain, absolutely right for cardiovascular fitness and muscle strength, but for knee joints, it's the absolute opposite. If it hurts, don't do it. Listen to your knee, adapt. So exercise advice. So go and see a physical therapist who can assess your posture, your movement, give you proper exercise advice, watch how you're doing things. And that can help people massively, all right?
one step up from that when you've got things like knee braces if you've got medial or lateral oa then you can have a medial or lateral offloading brace that can help very significantly in buying people a lot of extra time then you're talking about injections if you want to that's a minefield yeah and then one step up from that is arthroscopic surgery so there's been a lot in the press recently with various people who don't really know what they're talking about saying things silly things like knee arthroscopy doesn't work right but that's just daft it's just so stupid it's like saying it's like saying cars don't work right because i want to plow my field right and my you know ferrari is rubbish at plowing fields so cars don't work duh you need a tractor you know or vice versa arthroscopy simply means looking inside a knee right so arthro joint scopy look yeah. it doesn't tell you anything about why you're doing it or who the patient mm -hmm. is what yeah what the state their knee is what you find when you get in there what you do doesn't tell you anything right somebody comes to me and said i've had a knee arthroscopy i'm like well well done i don't know yeah. i have no idea what you're talking about because i don't know what they've done or what they found etc yeah if you just wash out an arthritic joint it does nothing all right but that's not news we've known that for many many years it's a silly and pointless thing to do yeah. if you've got somebody with no damage in their knee what well, an arthroscopy is not going to help but if you've got somebody with so much damage that there's, there's no cartilage left it's just bare bone then again it's, you've, you've missed the boat it's pointless an arthroscopy is not going to help you've got to find those people in the middle of that bell-shaped curve yeah. where there's torn bits loose bits rough bits unstable bits and then if you tidy up the joint you can make a significant difference and buy them extra time mm. so that's an option for some people yeah if it comes to wanting to delay arthros arthritis one of the best things you can do is to repair things rather than remove them so if you've got a meniscal tear it's much better to have it repaired rather than then trimmed or or just left to get worse but that's good, that's mainly for younger people mm. and that means not leaving people it means if you've got a meniscal tear as a younger person you're better off having it dealt with surgically sooner rather than later as opposed to if you've got a, a degenerate meniscal tear in an old person, most of them, not all of them, but most of them are better off left alone. So again, horses for courses. Yeah. Yeah. Then you've got more complicated stuff, like if you've lost your meniscus, well, you can replace it. You can put in a meniscal transplant, and that's a donor meniscus. Or if you've got a patch, a focal patch of articular cartilage that's missing, then you can do things like articular cartilage grafting, but that's much, much more complicated. And then you're getting up to more invasive stuff, but not a full knee replacement. You can do things like focal resurfacing with little mini custom made partial replacements. Yeah. Then you can do proper partial knee replacements where you're only replacing part, resurfacing part of the knee rather than the whole thing, all the way up to total knee replacements. You can also delay a total knee replacement in somebody who's got a wonky knee, if they've got a varus or valgus. Uh, malaligned knee by doing a realignment osteotomy to, to take the pressure off the the most affected area so there's lots and lots of options yeah. but it all starts with get a proper diagnosis so you know exactly what the damage is how bad the damage is which bit which bits of the knee are affected and then have a proper discussion with somebody who kind of knows what they're talking about so that you can go through all of the options, the options. And you can yeah eliminate the ones that are not appropriate or not relevant yeah. and then talk in detail about the pros and the cons of the ones that might be appropriate yeah I mean, that's, a, that's a great overview i mean in terms just to pick up on a few of the ones you just mentioned there so you, you started off you mentioned um, a meniscal uh, meniscal graft you know a whole meniscus is that am i right in saying that's that's taken from a cadaver is that right you know a dead basically a dead donor and you're then using that meniscus in to transplant okay. into the patient yeah and it, it's presumably treated in a way that doesn't cause um, any kind of reaction in the body or you know rejection from the body is that, is that right yeah, so when, the, when a retrieval, let's say somebody dies on ITU um, and they haven't had an infection, it's like, unfortunately, it's a young person who's had trauma and, um, and the family want to um, donate the, their, de their deceased loved one's organs. Well, the retrieval team take loads of stuff. Mm -hmm. They take bone, ligaments, cartilage, um, corneal grafts, heart valves, all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. And if you, the donors are screened and tested any high risk categories, any history of infection, it's not used. The donor's blood is tested for viruses, bacteria, fungi, any positives, it's not used. The tissue is tested, it's taken sterile and it's tested, any positives for any contaminants, it's not used. And then 
it's sterilized right and, and the the way we, we sterilize tissue now is chemical sterilization not gamma ra radiation because that damages tissue so it's sterilized and then it's deep frozen so the risk of disease transmission in a donor meniscus is less than one in 1.5 million it's tiny right wow also there's no living cells in the tissue yep, and the yep. cellular material that is there which is dead is locked within a dense matrix of, of cartilage so your immune system can't get to it so it doesn't elicit an immune response so it there's no rejection it's called immunoprivileged tissue so anybody can have anybody else's meniscus as long as you match left knee, right knee, medial and lateral because they're all different shapes and you've got a size match, the size of the, the donor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and what's the, if you get all those things correct, what, what would you say are the, uh, well, A, what the outcome's like and B, what's the rehab like for somebody going, undergoing that kind of uh, operation? Okay, rehab is really quite difficult, very slow. You're on crutches with a knee brace for six weeks, then you start getting going, and it takes about nine months or so to fully plateau in the recovery. Right. Success rate is about 80 to 85 percent at five year follow up. Mm, okay, that's pretty high. Yeah, yeah. And you know, this is not this is not new science. The first human, uh, the first series of human meniscal transplants was reported on by a guy called Klaus Milikowski back in 1989. It's been around for a long time. It's right. just that it's really fiddly, really difficult, really complicated surgery, so not many people do it. Yeah. Um, and there's only about a well, there's only a handful of us in the UK who do it on a regular basis. Mm. So that's why a lot of people don't even know about it, unfortunately. Heard of it. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, and then you know, again, you mentioned also about the the focal chondral grafting. So this is this is I'm guessing this is where people have a you know essentially like a small little divot or little you know um, ulcer, let's say cartilage ulcer in there somewhere in there. Um, in the joint and that's something you can treat you can plug you can kind of then you know smooth off your life and fill that gap in essentially so that, that's yeah it. yeah there's lots of different ways of doing that um the the, the technique that, uh, that i tend to use is something called amic which stands for autologous membrane induced chondrogenesis mm. nice catchy little title yeah <laughs> um and what you're doing is using a bio a bioabsorbable synthetic scaffold to plug the gap where the cartridge should be Okay. And you do what's called nano drilling, it's yep. like a, which is an advanced version of microfracture, but with much smaller holes, it causes less damage. Yeah. And so you're perforating the surface of the bone to make it bleed into the scaffold that acts like a sponge, which captures all the the bone marrow cells and hopefully stem cells um, that from the actual bone, and that grows new cartilage tissue. What, what's your cutoff for that in terms of if, if let's say you know years out there have have they know they've got more than one of those lesions so they've got a couple or two or even three you know yeah. and even kissing lesion we've got opposing lesions we've got one on that surface one on that surface you know can you still use that technique or is that again getting a little bit too far down the line for that yeah smaller the defect and the simpler things are the more likely you are to have a successful outcome mm -hmm. so very broadly speaking it's a little bit artificial to say this but broadly speaking if you've got one lesion then you know, tell the patient that it's going to be a roughly 80% success rate for five year follow up. Yeah. Right. If you're going to have two lesions, so you're going to do it in two different areas of the knee, yeah. then well, that's 0 0.8 times 0 0.8, which is a 64% chance of a good outcome. Okay. Yeah. A little bit artificial, but if therefore, if you have three, yeah. then it's, you know, you're approaching about a 50% probability. Right. But then it depends on the surface area. The bigger the, the, bigger the surface area of the defect, the, the lower the chance of it working. Also, a lower chance of it working when you've got kissing lesions. Yeah. But with a kissing lesion, if you if you do one side, but don't do the other side, then the side you've done is going to fail. So you either do both sides. If you've got bone on bone, you either do both sides or don't bother. Oh, I see. Right. And, and also, if you've got a femoral condyle and a tibial plateau, and you're going to do a cartilage graft on both, but yeah. if you haven't got a normal meniscus or a decent enough meniscal remnant in place yeah. to protect both surfaces, then it It'll also fail. It'll also fail. So if you end up doing a meniscal transplant with a cartridge graft at the top and a cartridge graft underneath, then that's called a biological knee replacement. And that's really, really full on. Yeah. And that's only ever done as an absolute last resort in people who, who've got loads of damage, but who are, are too young for a knee replacement. Yeah. So you hit a you hit a cutoff point where the damage is so bad that the probability of a good outcome is just not worth the pain, the hassle, the risk of the surgery, in yeah. which case you know you've missed the boat yeah. and also there's a cutoff point in, to, in terms of age so most people agree yeah. that it's not really appropriate to do cartridge grafting or transplantation in people over the age of 50 
Some people say 55, but you know, it's a little bit arbitrary. And it's not being ageist, it's about practicality. Are you, you, know, are you talking about the meniscal transplants or are you talking both. about the, the, the AMIC? Yeah, both. Both, oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Because the older you are, then the, the poorer your healing potential, the lower the probability of a good outcome, combined yeah. with the fact that the older you are, the closer you are to the age where uh, artificial joint replacement is more appropriate. Yeah, yeah, got it, yeah. Um, and if we, take it, if we take the simple version, let's say it's a one lesion and it's a, just a you know 80% outcome uh, we, we're hoping for, again, what's the rehab like for that for somebody going through that? Yeah, similar. It depends on which surface of the knee you've actually done the graft on. So let's say it's a weight-bearing surface of the femoral condyle. Yep. I would again put put the patient in a knee brace locked in full extension for the first two weeks because I don't want the graft to shear off, yep. um, and have them minimal toe touch partial weight bearing. So effectively, you know, non weight bearing, but yep. that's better than non weight bearing. Yep. Um, non weight bearing for six weeks with the two crutches, knee straight for the first two weeks, and then gradually, slowly get the knee going with unloaded range of motion exercises, only yep. starting the weight bearing from six weeks post op onwards. Okay. okay. And what about for things like uh, patellofemoral disease? Is that does it work equally well, less well? What's what's the yeah the right the best results for cartridge grafting on the femoral condyle. Second best results are in the trochlea. Third are sort of kind of not very good results at all on the patella and the and the um, tibial plateau. The patella is a small bone with a poor blood supply, with almost no blood, bone marrow, and very few, if any, stem. Themselves. So the healing potential there is much, much poorer. Also, the patellofemoral joint is a bit different from the rest of the knee. The, a large percentage of patellofemoral problems arise um, as secondary issues, with the primary problem being abnormal patellofemoral morphology, like patella dysplasia or trochlear dysplasia, mm -hmm. um, and or lateral patella maltracking. Mm -hmm. So if you've got morphological or biomechanical problems with your patellofemoral joint, then you're more likely to have problems. And if you st simply stick a cartilage graft in, a, in an abnormal patellofemoral joint where the cartilage, the, the normal existing cartilage has already failed, then your graft is just going to fail. Right. So have there ever been examples where you've done that in a patellofemoral joint or do you most of the time not, not entertain it? Yeah, done it. Yeah. yeah. And variable outcomes. Um, my personal opinion is that the success rate for cartilage grafting on the back of the patella is probably realistically in the region of maybe 50% or so. Mm. And that's not very good. And by that you mean 50% at five years, they're, they're still okay, is that, is that what I'm understanding? Yeah, at five years, what about 50%, they're still happy with their outcome, 50%, no, it's, you know, it's already failed yeah. within, that, within that five year period. Yeah. Yeah, either very quickly year, or three year, three year. Yeah, yeah, got it. Yeah, okay, fascinating. Um, okay, so let's say now then we're going down the route of somebody you know needing a knee replacement or a partial knee replacement, and then you already mentioned at the beginning that you on that ladder you'd be starting with a potentially thing about a partial rather than a full because that's you know um, less of a deal. Let's say still a big deal, but less of a deal. Um, again, what's your advice with regards to um, you know options for people? You know with that i mean i'm thinking now things like i'm getting into the sort of you know the specifics of things things like custom knees versus non-custom knees and you know the people have heard of the conformist which i know you you are a, a, you know you do the conformist knee mm. uh, what's your reflections on, on those Next okay that, that, that's a fairly easy one so with a standard knee replacement what you're doing is they've the companies design a knee and they come in size a b c d Okay, so boom, 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 boom. But in terms of shape, they're designed as there's one shape. So they're all designed by the same shape, in other words, the same geometry. And the assumption is that everybody's got roughly the same shape knees. Well, that's not true. What they do is they, they're designed by taking large numbers of CT scans and working out what the average knee is. Mm -hmm. okay. But shape is also on a bell shaped curve. You know, everything with biology is on a bell shaped curve. So if you're lucky in terms of size, and if you're in the middle of size A or the middle of size B, you're going to get something that fits in terms of size. Mm. But if you're halfway between the two, you're going to get something that's either a bit too big or a bit too small. Mm. In terms of shape, if you're kind of roughly normal in that bell-shaped curve and in that middle average-ish bit, yeah. then it's probably going to roughly match the shape of your knee. But if you're on the left or the right-hand side, then you're going to, have, you're going to end up with um, something that's just the wrong shape. It doesn't feel right. Now, yeah, if it's not the wrong shape, sorry, if it's not, if it's the wrong shape, 
then the kinematics are going to be slightly different, which means it's not going to feel quite right. Yeah. So, yeah. and also the other thing is that you have to cut the bone to match the prosthesis. Yeah. So you take away more bone with a, a standard knee replacement. Right. Yes. Yeah. So with a custom made knee, what you do is you do a CT scan and then the company design the prosthesis to match the exact, and we're talking like sub millimeter perfect with the exact size, shape and contours of that patient's knee. So number one, you have to take away less bone and that's really important in terms of fixation strength, bone stock and few potential future revision surgery. Yeah. Um, number two, um, it's slightly less invasive. So there's a little bit less blood loss and probably a slightly easier early post-op recovery, but that's not the most important thing. Yeah. And the most important thing is that it's more likely to feel better and give you a better outcome with a higher patient satisfaction rate. So that's the key. Everybody talks about survivorship figures when it comes to knee replacement. Well, it's it's almost a given. Any half decent prosthesis now and nowadays that's good enough to be used used is going to have a ten a ten year survivorship figure of at least ninety five percent. Right. Okay? And that, that's so that's a given. Yeah, that's a given. All right. Yeah. Or if it's not, then it's a suboptimal implant. So all of the implants, it doesn't matter if it's 96 or 96.5%, you know, who cares? Yeah, yeah. If you've got a knee replacement that you hate. Yeah. So what's the point of having a, a knee replacement that lasts you 20 years if it's 20 years of torment? Yeah. Right? So with a standard knee replacement, patient satisfaction rates are about 80 to 85%. Now that sounds pretty good until you flip it around the other way and say that about 15 to 20 percent of people are unhappy with their knee. And if you think that there's under normal in normal times, you know, without COVID and everything, then there's about 100,000 knee replacements done per year in the UK. So that's about 15 to 20,000 people a year having knee replacement surgery who are unhappy with their outcome. And that's massive. And that's why knee replacement surgery has got a bad rep. A yeah. lot of people say, oh, no, it's, it's not that nice. You know, it's not that good an operation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, with the conformist knee, patient satisfaction rates are 95%. So you shouldn't look at it as like a 10% improvement from 85 to 95. Flip it around the other way. Your patient dissatisfaction rate drops from about 15% down to about 5%. That's a two-thirds reduction in unhappy patients. Yeah. And, that, and that's absolutely massive. Yeah, absolutely. So, okay, so just playing devil's advocate for a second then. So what, what do you say to the critics um, of the, you know, conformist knees and, and other custom-made knees who will say things like, uh, well, you know, the, the, the longevity data just isn't quite there, they're, they're relatively new and the survivorship, you know, we haven't proved that they can last, last 25 years. And, you know, what if you're getting a situation where the person's, let's say they're in the younger, younger age group, you know, whatever, towards, you know, either end of 60 and, you know, part of their you know, if you like biomechanics, 40 biomechanics for one of a better word, has led to part of their, you know, joint arthritis in the first place. And then if you're then just replicating that, you're, you know, you're doing a CD print and you're putting back their normal knee, but that, that normal knee feels great, but actually it means their kinematics and their biomechanics are slightly suboptimal. Is there a risk then that, you know, that knee is not going to last them? I know you said it will last 10 years, but is it, is it a risk significantly? It's not going to last the 25 years, let's say of a, whatever, you know, Zimmer Biomed kind of, you know, next gen knee or something. Is that, is that, where, where do you sit with that argument? That was about ten questions, wasn't it? Sorry. Uh, rolled in. <laughs> uh, I'll try and pick that. I'll try and try and get that. All right. Um, oh, oh, I mean, right. In, in simple terms, I'm just saying. You know, in terms of if you have somebody who's got, I don't know, let's say they've got really a big, you know, big virus knee to begin with, and that's what's led to some of their, you know, compartment osteoarthritis, and then we're replacing that those that that, that okay. biomechanics. No. no, no. So what you do is the CT scan, right? The planning CT goes from hip to knee to ankle. Yeah. All right. And then it, then it focuses on the knee to get the really accurate geometry of the knee. And the design engineers, what they do is they design the prosthesis right, to as closely match the geometry of the patient's knee as possible, whilst at the same time correcting any deformities. Okay, so that's so the they actually They actually do cheat a bit right. on our behalf. Now, right. that's very difficult. As a surgeon, right, any decent surgeon's got OCD, right, and, and, and they're all control freaks, right? And you want that. You know, you want your surgeon to be... Absolutely, yeah. to have OCD because the opposite is to be less say fair and not really give a shit about what you do <laughs> you don't want that right <laughs> so um it's very difficult of a surgeon to relinquish control and to abdicate the responsibility for the design of a prosthesis to a design engineer sitting in, in a CAD CAM lab in Boston yeah. right? 
And so when you first do it, you're very, very nervous. I, I did my first one in 2012. And what happens is the more you do, the more confidence you gain in the whole concept and the design and the prosthesis. So I've done over, over 300. And nowadays, pretty much every knee replacement I do is, is custom made. And so far, touch wood, I've not had a single one that doesn't fit or that doesn't, you know, doesn't do the job as intended. Right? Yeah. The, big, the biggest worry with a custom made knee is, and I really, really hesitate to say this, is the risk of you potentially dropping it in theatre. Right. And then you're in a bit of trouble because there's only one. It's not like you've got a spare one on the shelf. Yeah. Yeah. Touch wood again, that's not happened yet. <laughs> Urgh, wish I hadn't even talked about it. Um, so no, if there's deformity, you correct it. Right. So it, you, you don't purposely replicate bad, uh, bad biomechanics. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in terms of outcome, the conformis I total is an ODEP 5A rated prosthesis. So it's got the best possible rating you can get for five year follower. There's no 10 year rating yet because it hasn't been around long enough. You know, I, I did the first conformist knee in the whole of the UK and that was back in 2012. Yeah. So it's not been lo around long enough to get your 10 year outcome data. Five year outcome data is strongly predictive of 10 year data. Mm -hmm. Okay. But it's not definitive. Mm -hmm. Now you've got a real dilemma there. If you want something that's tried and tested with 15 year follow up, yeah. then you're going to be looking at a prosthesis that, that was designed 20 plus years ago. Yeah. If you want something with the latest tech, then it's going to be relatively untried and tested. It's not going to have that long 10, 20, 30 year follow up. Yeah. So you've got, you can't have it both ways. You can't have something that is, um, you know, up to date technologically and cutting edge and have 20 year follow up data. Yeah. Right. The, the rate of technology is moving on. It, things are progressing rapidly. So you've got to find a careful balance. Yeah. But, but the conformist knee is not new. No. no. Um, they started doing them in America a couple of years before we started doing them in the UK. And it's been done in really big numbers. And when you've got a relatively new prosthesis then the, on the market, then what you do is that the company signs up to what's called the Beyond Compliance Register. And the Beyond Compliance Register is like a really beefed up version of the National Joint Register, where they look at things in much, much more detail. And the Beyond Compliance Register data shows that the early revision rate for conformist knees is about 60% lower than it is for the average knee on their register. Right, wow. It, it, it's, it's like massively, massively better. I so what, yeah, yeah, what I can't tell you, what nobody can tell you is what, what's gonna happen to these knees in 20 years time. Yeah. Right now, theoretically, you've, you've picked up on a really interesting point because theoretically, if you've got a knee replacement that's really crap, so that the patient can't use it and they don't do anything, well, the rate of wear and tear is going to be pretty slow. Mm. Right? It's probably going to last them a lifetime. They may die young because they're fat and they've had a heart attack <laughs> because they can't move. I'm not laughing. You made me laugh then by grinning at me. Um, um, that's horrible. Um, so if you've got a knee replacement that's so, so good that people feel great, they want to do stuff, Right. And if they get carried away, they start going back to skiing, which which some of my patients do. And, it, and that terrifies me. Or they go back to playing tennis, which they do. You know, uh, not all of them, obviously, yeah. the, the younger, fitter, more athletic ones. Um, I had a young guy who's 37 come to see me from Ireland with an absolutely wrecked knee. And nobody, not a single surgeon that he went to see in Ireland would agree to doing his knee because he's only 37. Yeah. came to me he's, he's absolutely wrecked multiple multiple previous operations and he's in agony and he's begging me to do a knee replacement so i had the, the exact conversation with him about survivorship and the reduced survivorship when you do it in young people because they're more active and they live longer so bigger probability bigger yeah. risk of revision within your lifetime and he said i understand that but i'm 37 i can't live my life i need it please do do it i've done it i yeah. did it and then three months post-op he sent me a video of him jumping up on boxes and hopping on one leg and skipping around in the gym. And I was like, no, 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 that's too good. All right? Because I don't want people pounding their knee because I want it to last as long as possible. So you've got big dilemma there, right? Do you have fun and you know live your life to the max, all right? Go for it, but have a faster rate of wear and tear, or are you really cautious, really careful? Do you do less 
and yeah, you have a knee that lasts longer, but your life's miserable. Yeah. And the answer is you have the sensible balance. Yeah. So like you say, just to clarify, so that example you gave the guy, he's you know, near the sort of 40 age mark, and then he has, he has the knee, he's very happy for 10, possibly 20 years, but then almost certainly he's going to need, you know, around about the age of 60, well, not almost certainly, but the high probability around the age of 60, he's going to be looking at second knee replacement. And yep. it's the case of, well, then I've still got some life to live. 60 is not that yep. old. Where do you go from there? I mean, where, where do you go from there if you're in that scenario? Is it a case of you do another compromise or a compromise is now not no. enough and you have to go for no. the other one? Yeah, you can't, you can't do, right, conformists don't do revision knees. Right. This is a custom-made prosthesis that's made with millimetre precision to fit the knee. Yeah. And with revision surgery, the main reason for revision is that if you've got the femur and you've got your prosthesis on, is that you get aseptic loosening yeah. where the bone shrinks back a little bit and the whole thing becomes a bit loose. Yeah. So number one, you can't really get a proper X-ray, sorry, you're using X-rays, you can't get a proper CT to give you the exact bone morphology when you've got metal work covering it over. Yeah. Number two, you don't know quite how much bone has been resorbed, yeah. right? especially once you've freshened up the bone to, back to a decent surface. Yeah. And then number three, then you don't know how much bone is going to get pulled away with the prosthesis when you're removing the prosthesis and the cement. Right. So you don't know what the shape is going to be all right, so there's no way you can use a, a patient-specific custom-made prosthesis for that. Yes. Right. A, conform, a conformist knee. You're going to have to use a revision prosthesis. Yeah. And a revision prosthesis is a, is a different entity. Yeah. They come with augments. They come with, some of them are hinged. Most of them comes with stems. There's, there's loads of options. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But what happens is the more, the more revisions you do or the, more, the bigger the revision is, then the more metal work you end up with, and what that means is, in other words, the less bone stock you've got. Yeah. Now, the less bone stock you've got, then the harder it is to fix the prosthesis. So it's more likely to fail at the prosthesis bone interface and loosen and therefore cause further problems. Yeah. 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 Um, so, yeah, the you can do, and people do do, revision knee replacements. But the way that I explain it to my patients is the revision is twice as big, twice as difficult, double the complication rate, slower recovery and poorer outcomes and doesn't last as long compared to primary. That's why you want to try and delay, delay your first knee replacement for as long as you reasonably can. Yeah. And you want to avoid doing it when you're younger, if possible. And if you have had it done, look after it as best you can as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And then you just very briefly touched on it there, and that's one of my other questions, and one of the, sort of the, the, the phrases people would have heard of is, you know, it's uncemented versus cemented. So just, just explain what we mean by that. So a cemented knee is basically where literally you're using bone cement to bond the, you know, the prosthesis to the bone, and an uncemented is basically where you're not using any cement. The idea is the bone grows into the prosthesis, and the theory is that you're going to get less... Well, you're not going to... There's no cement there to degrade, and therefore there's less possible, less chance of that aseptic loosening that you mentioned. But... Um, Am, am I right in saying then the from what you've already, you already said it that the conformist knee is a cemented knee? Is that is that yeah? To the yeah, case? conformist is, yeah, all, all conformist knees are cemented. Yeah. Um you could be it's not the cement that degrades, right? Cement doesn't degrade. All right. Okay. It's the bone that shrinks back and it will shrink back from either cement or a prosthesis, whether it's cemented or uncemented. Oh, okay. Right. So what the research shows is that if you have an uncemented femoral prosthesis thesis that goes on the end of the femur yeah. then the outcomes are just as good as cemented so there's really not not, not, not okay. nothing really to pick between the two yeah. but the outcomes for an uncemented tibia are not as good so you're better right. off cementing the tibia and if you're going to cement the tibia you might as well cement the femur okay so it's, when it's, it comes yeah when it comes to the patella button assuming you're resurfacing the patella as well then that's better off being cemented as well right so so you're saying from the research shows that cemented has no downsides no, didn't say that. Um, right, the, in terms, we're talking about outcomes. Yeah. Yeah. Now, so the, what, what, what would what potentially then could be the negatives to having cemented? Because right. there was there was some research that was published a little while ago that suggested mainly for hip replacements that if you use cement, there's a slightly higher risk of cardiac complications because the the um, the monomer part of the cement, the liquid part of the cement, can um, is can potentially be cardiotoxic right, to the okay. cardiac muscle. So it can act, can actually cause cardiac problems. It's absolutely rare as hen's teeth. Um, it's, it's not a realistic problem when it comes to knees. Um, and most knee replacements that are done in the world are cemented. Okay. 
and certainly the tibial prosthesis is cemented. Good to know. But in, in, you know, whether you're going to do, do a cemented femur or a cemented femur, it really doesn't matter greatly. Um, the conformist knees are not designed as an uncemented version yet. I've heard them talking about possibly bringing out an uncemented femur, but by the time that you're talking about this kind of detail, these yeah. are the conversations that nerdy knee surgeons have at length, but normal people don't bother getting into this because it's, it's real minutiae. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, what about so you mentioned again you touched again patellofemoral so let's, let's say we've got somebody you know with because some, sometimes people will ha will have their knee recap, kneecap replacement sometimes they won't depending obviously if there's disease there um can you give us an overview of of you know the outcomes and kind of expectations are they different to the other compartments of the knee um mm -hmm. and all that it's really confusing um again it's a difficult conversation to get into um even with a knee surgeon let alone if you're not a knee surgeon, it's probably not even worth getting into it. It's so confusing, but all right, to try and sum it up, some people never resurface the patella. Some people always resurface the patella. Some people selectively resurface the patella. If it looks bad, they'll resurface it. If it looks good, they won't. Okay. There's, 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 there's little evidence to give you a strong indication in one way or the other as to which one's best or which one's not. Very little evidence to point you in either direction. Um, however, a lot of it depends on the geometry of your femoral prosthesis. So if you're born with a fairly shallow patella, so a fairly kind of shallow patella, but you have a prosthesis where the, the trochlear is designed as a deeper groove, then you're going to get point loading. Yeah. It's, not going to, it's not going to be congruent. So you're more likely to end up with problems if you don't resurface. The people who don't resurface say that, well, there's one less thing to do intraoperatively, so the operation's quicker, a little bit less complicated, and that there's one less thing to go wrong in terms of the patella button either wearing or loosening. However, the people who always resurface say that, well, if, it, if you might end up potentially not resurfacing, and then somebody comes back with anterior knee pain and you have to go back in and resurface them later, well, then that's two ops instead of one, so why not do it first time round? Yeah. So the, I always resurface, always, because what I don't want to do is have a patient come back to me and say, well, my knee still hurts, right? And then say to me, well, why didn't you bother resurfacing the patella when it's sitting there looking at you and it takes literally an extra less than five, well, five minutes max to yeah. cut and resurface the patella. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm one of those people who always resurfaces the patella. Yeah, and I, I'm, I'm guessing for people who have you know, actual patellofemoral pain as part of their mix of pain, it, it, it's a presumably an easy decision to make, is it not? Yeah. As, as in they yeah, shouldn't replace it. If they've got pain coming from that area, then you want to go to a surgeon who's going to replace your patella. You don't want to be ending up with one who hasn't replaced your patella. <laughs> right. Presumably. Yeah. And, he, and even if even if you go in there and the patella looks perfect, normal morphology, normal tracking and decent cartilage, well, you're converting you know, a, a knee into your patella is going to be rubbing on a metal surface. Mm. which is not got the same low coefficient of friction as, as normal articular cartilage. Mm. So um, I think my personal approach is it's the most sensible option overall is to always resurface the patella. Yeah. But you could, you could literally have an entire academic meeting with a, you know, 100 orthopedic surgeons all shouting at each other over this yeah, issue. I can imagine. I can imagine. Yeah. But in, in your hands and in your experiences, then um, the, the, uh, you know, sort of the, the satisfaction ratings and the outcome ratings that you went to before, they will apply obviously in this instance because you would be a, you know i'm saying the patellofemoral then you would still expect them to be lasting hopefully 10 years have a have a high satisfaction rating as you said compromise 95 percent all of those things would, would apply i'm guessing yeah it's it's very very rare actually to see aseptic loosening of the patella that's not normally the reason the most common places you see it on the femur and the, and the tibia okay and so, how, how quickly does that button that patellofemoral button wear down though is that is that a realistic thing that happens or not no not that i've seen Mm. It can happen, but I can't remember ever having seen it. Mm. Like, maybe I'm getting older, I just can't remember seeing it. <laughs> if, it's, if you can't remember it, if you can't remember the last time you You're saw it, it's yeah. really rare. Yeah. And, and, those, and those patients you mentioned, you've been doing these conformist knees since 2012. Are you still in touch with some of those patients or do you still keep track on them? And, and how, how's that monitored over time? Um, perfect, right, they are... I, I what I tend to do is I tend to follow the patients up until if I'm worried about them I'll, I'll follow them right up until six months 
if everything's going well, I'll see them in clinic at three months. Yeah. Um, and then I'll simply ask them to drop me an email to update me on progress at six months. Yeah. From that point onwards, I don't routinely follow them up. We don't do surveillance. The insurance companies don't cover people to do that. They, they, then, you know, people are not covered for routine surveillance. Um, and also, if somebody is developing a problem with a prosthesis, then nearly always they're going to develop symptoms. So if you've got an asympton in asymptomatic need that you're happy with, then actually it's pretty unnecessary to do. You don't need to see them every year and do an X-ray and say how you're doing. You know, yeah. it's just unnecessary. If they've got a symptom, if they've got even the slightest concern, then I want them to get back in touch with me. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And also the national national joint. If if they end up going to someone else and there's a problem, well, it's going to shut. And if they, you know, if if God forbid somebody ends up having a revision, well, it's going to show up on the national joint registry. Right. Because Which every is single patient. Yeah. Yeah. Every single patient I do is registered on, on the national joint registry. So anybody who needs a revision. This is assuming they're in the UK, they're not from abroad. Then anybody who needs a revision in the UK will also be registered, and there will be a link between the revision and whoever did the primary, and it shows yeah. up, and we get report, we get annual reports. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, and that, that's really, really, really insightful, really fascinating. And I've, yeah, found it absolutely. <laughs> so uh, yeah, fantastic. How, how comes you're how comes you're asking such good questions about knees? You're asking this is. You're asking way better questions than most people ask. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe one of those, like you say, one of those kind of you know meticulously minded people. Like, like you just, great, like, love it. I just, I just, I just, I just love seeing knowing all the detail. Um, and, and I suppose, I suppose the truth is, I think, in, well, in my experience, a lot of people that are facing knee replacements, especially these days, increasingly with the, you know, the amount of information that's out on the web they do tend to sort of you know look into these things quite a bit they mm. tend to sort of know the different options that often they'll spend you know a long time researching with it researching it and yeah. knee surgeons as well so yeah. you know th th these just struck me as the sort of questions that a the people will, would want to know the answer to or b these are sort of questions they should be ans ans asking if that makes sense you know because so, um, what do you think i'm going to turn it around now what do you, yeah. what do you think about robotic what? knee surgery Oh, I didn't ask you that one, didn't I? That's one, one no, no, I'm one. asking you. I'm asking yeah, you. Now. What, what do I think? Well, listen, I'm not a knee surgeon, so I'm not qualified. For that. <laughs> <laughs> but, oh, that's a cop out. Come on. Um, what do I think? Okay, so I started off. I started off just some different bits and bobs that I'd seen, and different posts that I'd seen, thinking, "Wow, this robotic stuff sounds sounds like it is. It should be the way to go." Mm. And, it, and, you know, and it makes it sound like oh, you know, robots are doing it. Robots are doing these things, and you think, well, that's, you know, that's got to be. You know, it's like it's it's like the autopilot on a, on an airplane has got to be better than human. There's no there's no room for error. But then I've started to hear some you know sort of counter arguments to that. Um, and and I think you know you you've mentioned on on well again you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but when you're going down the robotic knee surgery route, yes, those incisions may be you know millimeter or oh, well, micromillimeter perfect, but you're not talking about a custom-made knee you're talking about an off-the-shelf knee if you're talking about more bone loss so when you weigh all that, in, that up into the mix and if if like, like you say if you're then comparing somebody who's doing robotic knee surgery to somebody who's doing high volume knee surgery okay he's a human being but he's a high volume knee surgeon and all he does is knees and he you know and he's he's, he's got you know been doing it for years you know are you really going to find that that you know, ro robot is any better than that surgeon? I was like, that, I'm so lost. I've, I've, I've started to then swing. Well, no, actually, then if it was me, you know, and, and I would probably want to be going more at my age, we want to more go down the route of that custom made knee and forget the knee, forget the robotic knee surgery. But yeah. that, that's, that's just my personal, you know, I haven't got a black and white opinion on it, but that would be my thought process. Again, you can correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong there in that thought process. Yeah, absolutely, 100% agree with you. <laughs> Completely right. agree. Um, I think robotic knee surgery is a marketing scam. Um, the robot costs about a million quid, right? And therefore, if a hospital forks out a million quid for a robot, well, they're sure as hell going to market it. Mm. And the most important thing is, is does it really make any difference at all to the patient clinical outcomes? And the answer is no. That's a key question. Yeah. yeah. And the best, the best paper out there was by, I, I think they're a South Korean group. But anyway, it was Kim. Uh, they sound uh, South Korean. And they did a prospective randomized study with 750 robotic knees versus 766. I'm reading it right in front of me now. 
um, right. conventional knee replacements with a 10 year follow up and showed no difference whatsoever in any outcome metric. Wow. So in other words, it's pointless. Wow. And um, on the studies that keep on appearing about, oh yeah, a robotic knee is slightly better than a normal knee. Well, they're comparing it to a normal knee. So not once have they dared compare ro robotic knee, re knee surgery with a custom made knee. Mm -hmm. So um, a, a robotic knee replacement is more kit, more time consuming, there's a long learning curve. It's more, in, it's more intrusive, more invasive. You're, you're sticking uh, sensors, you're drilling um, basically metal rods into the femur and the tibia. Um, you know, the more, the more you know about it, the more you should shy away from it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, fantastic. I mean, again, fascinating. Ian, that's been really, really enlightening. And uh... yeah, I do think that the future, though, is probably robotics. I mean, it's you probably going to be, you know, virtual reality with haptics and everything so we'll we'll actually be there with 3d goggles gloves and we'll actually be doing stuff with a robot doing it for us right and we'll either be at home or we'll be sitting maybe in theater next to the patient i think i think you know just like stem cells gene therapy tissue engineering yeah you know, that is the future so it's good that some people are playing with this tech and gradually evolving it so there, there isn't you know that is a good point and what what advantage would would that type of you know technology produce? Then are you just make more rep, more replicable surgery? Is that is that what you mean? Or, or... no, no, it, it means you can operate with with tracksuit trousers on. Oh, okay. Now again, it comes back to the trousers, no trousers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Again, where we started. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay so that uh ian thank you again that was absolutely yeah that's a pleasure and uh yeah Ingo, just, just a caveat all right just just a caveat to anybody yeah. who does watch this number one if there's any bad language i apologize but not apologize um if i've offended you and if you're that easily offended good um if you want to complain please complain to robert not me um I, 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 I'm, I'm, address. <laughs> I, I may laugh about what a lot, a lot a lot of what I say, but I can promise you that I firmly and passionately believe everything that I've said and that everything I say is in always in my patient's best interest. Yeah, and I, I so, can I can I can corroborate that from having known you know the years he's, he's definitely got patient's best interest.